can we have you say and spell your name and also um, let us know your, your title here and the name of the brewery. Okay, uh, I'm Kelly Cubbin. I'm uh, with Southern Appalachian Brewery. I'm an owner manager, pretty much do everything except brew the beer. Um, and uh, my name is K-E-L-L-Y-C-U-B-B-I-N. Awesome. So today is Wednesday, June 27th, and we're at Southern Appalachian Brewing in Hendersonville, North Carolina. So Kelly, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Where, where are you from and how did you get here? Sure, I'm from Michigan, um, suburbs of Detroit, and um, I grew up there, went to college in Ann Arbor, and um, was an art major, and then moved to Chicago, and um, was there about 10 years. My husband and I just bought our first house, and he found the beginning of this brewery for sale, and we'd always loved the area and wanted to get closer to nature, so here yeah. we are. So do you guys, how, how, how had you come here before? How did you know this area? Uh, my in-laws live in South Carolina and okay. we would drive through. Uh, we also had a friend who got married in Virginia and spent some time on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And we just, we just absolutely loved it. <laughs> Very cool. So can you talk a little bit about the history of Southern Appalachian prior to your purchase? Prior to us, yes. Um, so they were really pioneers. It started as Appalachian, Cra or Appalachian Brewing Company back in 2003 and um, you know that was really really early on for the Western North Carolina beer movement and um, the owners uh, Jamie Sellers and a friend of his set it up on their property they went and got real big time I think quicker than they had imagined they'd actually been talking to the Charlotte Bobcats about their Bobcat Ale um, you know way back in 2004 2005 and I think um, it just it grew a little bit too much for them as kind of retirement jobs and they actually put it for sale online and um, they had up to that point they were widely distributed Brevard Asheville they had brand recognition uh, just draft only and then they put it for sale online yeah and that's how you guys that's how we found, found it. it yeah 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 so what what was kind of the ultimate piece that led you to purchase that? I sort of joke it was my husband's pre-midlife crisis because um, we had literally just settled down in a home and um, he found it for sale and he said I'm not I'm not ready I want to I want to try this and we've been looking at doing it in Chicago where we were living um, with some friends and one of his brothers and the three-tier system back then was so different it really wasn't friendly to the brewery system and the cost was just absorbent exorbitant so uh, finding this was kind of a I guess a good little find back in 2006 because it seemed no risk to us. It was an established brand. They had accounts, they had recipes, they had equipment. And, um, you know, it was really easy back then to get some small loans through family and um, kind of take a risk back then when there wasn't so much competition, I guess. Yeah. And, um, you know, you mentioned wanting to come to the area, but what was it about craft brewing, particularly at that time? That you, like you said, that's, that was pretty early on. It was so early on. And I have to admit, when, when I was in Chicago, my friends and I, we went out for wine and cocktails. You know, I thought it was fancy getting a Blue Moon or, you know, a Hawker Shore. And um, we had a lot of interesting feedback from friends, especially my girlfriends. Um, but my husband had been a home brewer, and don't know why we just said what could go wrong we don't know anybody um, you know we've really only home brewed how could this go wrong just it and it just seemed like such a small risk we weren't really starting from scratch which um, seemed really beneficial at that time mm -hmm. yeah so um, as you kind of were making that transition and, and moving into the business are there people or resources that you like looked at as mentors, resources you really relied on? I, absolutely. I think especially so early on. I mean, we bought the brewery and moved here in 2006. Our very second day after we unloaded the U-Haul was Brewgrass. And it was very overwhelming to say the least. My husband had helped brew the beer with the previous owners, but we had no idea. They set us up next to Highland. Highland had a huge stand-up bar. They had uniforms. You know, we had, I think the chairs the festival gave us and our old artwork. So luckily, I think it's still the case now, but back then everyone embraced each other because we all were kind of figuring it out together. And there weren't really any guidelines and there was no protocol and everyone just wanted to support the industry. So um, early on, I would say Mike Rangel with Asheville uh, Brewing, 
huge supporter, you know, take care of yourself, take care of your product, but you're, you're more important. Um, great advice. And um, I'd say Cheryl from Heinz Mention. She was really one of the first and only women I knew in the brewing industry back in 2006. And um, she was really supportive. And it was another husband and wife team. Right. So we got a lot of great advice from them. Um, I'd say John at Green Man, huge supporter. Everyone just really pulled together. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you guys originally uh, bought the brewery, you had wholesale operations in Fletcher? Yes. So we had to move it from the property where the uh, owners had started it. Okay. And we went to Fletcher completely wholesale, nothing open to the public. We were actually behind Budweiser of Asheville. Um, and, it, and it was really a chance for us to change the recipes, improve on them, try to get more accounts, and see if we could really compete in this market as it was growing. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the ways that you, you and your husband really put your own stamp on the brand? Absolutely. Um, we changed the name a little bit. Um, there was a little, uh, not competition, but there was an existing brewery out of Pennsylvania, Appalachian Brewing and the previous owners knew about it, but everything was so small and different then. And in the four or five years since they had started, um, Appalachian Brewing out of Pennsylvania was opening more tasting rooms, widening their distribution. So we changed the name to Appalachian Craft Brewery, really wanting to hone in on craft beer, um, because that was really becoming the term uh, as the industry was growing. And um, we updated artwork, we completely changed the recipes and overhauled. And, and really started to add to the product line and, and make our distribution more personal. And my husband was delivering the beer in his beat up pickup and I was doing sales calls on my lunch break, you know. Right. So trying to really get the mom and pop part and, and get that through to customers. Hey, we're making this and anything you need, we're the whole company at this point. Right. Um, so when you did decide to move here to Hendersonville, what, what led you to choose this location? This is actually a little embarrassing um, why we chose Hendersonville. We um, you know, started in 2006. We thought we'd end up in Asheville, and every year another brewery opened. It just won a year back then, but yeah. that seemed like a lot. So um, I actually used to work next to Green Man's Dirty Jacks, and my husband came to pick me up from work and saw a brew house being um, delivered to a building that we had been thinking about and we just went over to Dirty Jack's and had a beer and we said it's seven breweries that's <laughs> oversaturation which is comical now I mean there's what 28 30 at least but we just felt you know back then everyone had their home their brewery their home base why compete everyone here is doing great stuff and they've got allegiances and loyalty and who are we to try to step on that so we've been uh, making friends with people in Hendersonville we've been doing events fundraisers it really warm reception here and we kind of redirected uh, we looked at Brevard and we looked at Hendersonville and Hendersonville just felt like home to us yeah and so and can you describe kind of where we are in Hendersonville we are in what is I guess considered an up-and-coming neighborhood uh, it's more the industrial part of town um, 7th Avenue used to be Main Street back in the day it came off the um, train depot and led into town and this area is really heavily being revitalized and and we love the feel of that the potential uh, we love the space here and the ability to have concrete floors and no neighbors above us or next to us that we had to really worry about parking huge outdoor courtyard um, and, ju and just the promise of and the energy that this area has to change and grow yeah and um, you guys were the first brewery here right in the county in Henderson County yeah can you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that came from that that uh, it was a good growing experience a uh, good lesson lesson in patience um, let me see we had sorry I have to refer to my notes because it was okay. a while ago yes <laughs> um, we had at the time had six months of uh, free rent from our landlord and we thought that would be enough time to get this place up and running and we wouldn't have any overhead. Well, we had over six months in delays dealing with bureaucracy on, I hate to say, but the county level and the state level. And because we were the first ones, despite what was going on in Buncombe County right next door, no one really knew what to do with us. They didn't know what to do with our equipment. They didn't really know how to permit us. So we had a lot of 
frustrating delays, um, trying to get engineers involved. I think at, back then it was so new, no one really wanted to pull the trigger and be on record as signing off on this scary thing. Um, but we really fought hard. We had a lot of support from local city, um, the Henderson County Partner for Economic Development. So many people were behind us, and the city and the, and the um, community was so excited to see us open. So after a lot of delays, um, we actually got someone fired um, because they weren't doing their job. Um, but they've been great partners ever since. And, um, you know, we hope that we did help kind of modernize some of this. A lot of it was old laws, old um, permitting requirements. And so that all changed. Yeah. We, we actually had to be a private club our first year because of really antiquated ABC laws. And um, the county was dry up until, I think, four years ago. Uh, yeah, and again, the city really wanted to work with us. We had help from um, Mike Carricker, or Steve Carricker, um, Senator Apodaca, Chuck McGrady, Councilman. Everyone wanted to help us change this. So as soon as they could, they did, and the community voted, thankfully, to change some of these laws. Yeah, and so, I mean, Hendersonville, as a city, but also even the brewing community, has boomed oh. since then and changed dramatically. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's changed exponentially. I, I guess along with the rest of the country, yeah. you know? Um, although being a much smaller area, it feels like it's growing faster to us. You know, we were here, we've been here seven years now. Um, you know, we, we knew it was inevitable. Another brewery would open, Sanctuary opened, and um, then we had a few others open and closed since. And now we're looking at the potential for, I believe, six to be open this year, just in Hendersonville proper. So it's a little mind-blowing, I think, considering we thought seven in a city the size of Asheville was way too many. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, we've learned a lot. Yeah. Um, so here at Southern Appalachian, what do you consider to be the primary mission for the brewery here? Let's see. Um, I'm going to... Re refer to my notes again because we've we've had a lot of or missions. Theme. Yeah, the theme. Um, our our goal is really just basic, and it's going to sound simple, but we just want to make great beer and be involved in our community. It's really been our goal since day one, um, and to continue to do that, which isn't easy with growth and with all the other distractions. You know, but we've added live music. We've had actually live music since day one, but we've really tried to improve our live music. We've built an outdoor stage. We're slowly building our outdoor courtyard into be something a little bit um, nicer, I guess, versus the really industrial part we started with. Mm -hmm. uh, being family friendly, uh, and again, just supporting our community through fundraisers, and to just keep doing that. You know, everyone's opening, everyone's kind of grabbing onto this formula for what a brewery should be and all we can do is just keep doing it better. Yeah and in terms of uh, growing the brewery itself um, how, how has the kind of capacity size grown even the space you talked a little Sp bit about that. Yeah well our original brewery I mean I think it was a five barrel system no it was a three barrel somewhere in there yeah. I can't even remember. I'm trying to block it out. <laughs> completely different equipment that we inherited. Completely different system. So moving here, we were lucky to find um, a used 15-barrel uh, brew house. The entire system is 15-barrel. Our fermenters, our brights, everything. So that was a huge step up for us. We now have glycol, um, an entire glycol system. Big improvement from our old <laughs> method of making the beer. Um, let me see. So are you guys doing lagers and ales then? We are, yes. Uh, currently we're only doing one lager. You know, they're taking twice as long. That's why a lot of breweries aren't doing yeah. them, the commitment to it. But we've had a lot of um, a lot of great feedback on our Pilsner. And even though it's harder to make, takes longer, we're going to continue to do it. We only have five bright tanks right now and five fermenters. So it's a little harder for us to expand the lagering system at this point. Right. But um, we've definitely been really trying to increase our production. We're now with two different distributors um, all the way out to Wilmington and um, a little bit in South Carolina that we're trying to grow. 
So the guys are constantly trying to figure out, you know, how much is the tasting room going to go through with this event or that event, and how much are our distributors going to be ordering, and and that's really changing a lot with the growth of the industry. Um, it, you know, it's a little harder sometimes to figure out because now there's so many craft beers and so many great products, and um, staying being able to sell all the beer you can make, it's a lot harder now because there's so many taps. There's only limited tap space, I should say, and we're still only draft. Right. But we're really building our uh, barrel system, uh, barrel age system, and our sour program, and those are two really big uh, programs that we're, we're trying to push. Right. Since we got all of our standard styles really dialed in, we decided to focus on that first, and now they're having fun playing with some of the more experimental yeah. things. Um, how many... How many beers do you usually have on tap at a time? We started with three, um, and now we have, we make over 20 different styles. Wow. Uh, we only have 12 taps in our tasting room, so um, it gets a little tricky to try to really highlight all the beers we're making, so we've got to really try to stick with seasonals. Even though everyone wants our half of ice in year round, you can only get it in the summer. You can only get the autumn ale in the fall. You know, it's a lot of people want to sign petitions to have them available, but with the limited tap space, you know, and it's also nice to offer a seasonal. People gravitate towards that or small batch and experimental things. Right. So I think usually anywhere between 11 and 12 of our own beers on tap at any wow. time. And we got room for more. We just added a nitro tap also, which has been fun. Yeah, I noticed the, was it the coconut porter? Oh, yeah, it's crazy. It's <laughs> so good. It's, I know I'm biased, but it's really good. <laughs> so do you guys have a do you have a beer that you consider to be a flagship or do you just kind of have a standard absolutely the copperhead amber is what we are most well known for i'd say the copperhead and the black bear and um, those were two original beers to the original brewery back in 2003 um, the recipes are very different now but they're still our most popular beers yeah and your husband did the recipe tweaking yes, for yes. them we did a lot of research to help make that happen too but yeah yeah the um They've changed, but we're really happy with them, and our customers are happy, and our draft accounts are happy with them. They're, it's a solid American amber and a solid stout, and we're really proud of that. Yeah. To keep that consistency is really difficult, and especially with the craft beer scene, where people are only doing five gallons at a time, we find a special challenge in being able to do 15 barrels at a time and make it the same every time, and um, and to continue doing that. Right. Um, so. Thinking about, uh, I guess we've we've talked about the history, but thinking forward, what plans? What are your plans for the future? Like, where where do you see Southern Appalachian in three, four, five years? In the growth. Or further out. Yeah, further out. I hope so. Right. <laughs> you can only have exactly. After seven years. Um, well, a big thing for us would be expanding our tasting room. We know we really haven't made it as wonderful as we've imagined, you know, time constraints, budget constraints, but really expanding, especially the outdoor area, because our inside is so limited in capacity, and it's a big draw for uh, our regulars to be able to sit outside almost year-round and enjoy that. Um, probably adding more bathrooms as we get bigger. <laughs> um, we host a lot of street events and festivals here. Um, they're growing. Our, our biggest one is probably the vintage motorcycle show that we do every year, and that's uh, drawing, let me check our numbers, that went from about 500 to almost 5,000 people showing up here for that event. Wow. So um, these are events that we've seen and we've babied, and we've, you know, our Oktoberfest, um, we do a vintage market now, and things that we've really worked with the planners and the organizers to keep growing, and um, we really would like to see those grow more and turn them more into street festivals, which we've been doing. Um, I'd say also expanding our distribution and, and really getting up to our full capacity in brewing and, and getting more accounts. We also plan to do a bottle, uh, specialty bottle system for our barrel age and our sours, do some bottle releases, things that we have not done yet and being draft only and having just the, um, the growlers, it's a little limiting to where we can get out. So you right. know, really expanding on that, and, and we listen a lot to what our customers want, and, and try to try to do everything, and be everything for everyone. <laughs> but stay true to our focus, you know, right. and stay true to our, our goal. Right. So you've kind of touched on this already. You've talked about community, and then some of the events that you had. You guys have received some awards from your local chamber of commerce. Very um, can you talk about some of the work that you've done in terms of uh, supporting? 
local community, nonprofits, and things like that, like hyper local? Oh, absolutely. We try to stay as local as we can because there are so many nonprofits in, well, globally. But then you look at Western North Carolina and in Henderson County and Hendersonville, and we try to we try to do as much as we can with all of them. You know, we have a hard time saying no. <laughs> we have product that we can always donate. We're always happy to throw in gift certificates. We do a number of fundraisers here, and and we absolutely love doing it. We um, actually tomorrow we're setting up for a council on aging fundraiser that will benefit Meals on Wheels. We do programs with um, United Way. Um, the Community Foundation, the Blue Ridge Humane Society. I have a hard time saying no, and when it sounds like a good idea, it's like, hey, let's just try it. Let's see what happens. I feel like if we got good people involved, great board, and um, good feedback from our customers, it's, ju it's just fun. Yeah. You know, we've got the space for it. We may not have the time or necessarily the deep pockets, but we can definitely lend our location and, and help with that and get the word out. Yeah. Um, so, thinking broadly, industry-wide, you know, where do you see kind of the brewing industry in this area going in the next few years? You know, like you said, you've been, you, you guys are, are the senior brewery oh, in this say senior, area. Although <laughs> <laughs> well, that's better, someone called us the grandparents of the local brewing scene, and I was like, I'm not. Oh. I know what you mean, but let's rephrase that. Yeah. It's better than just flat out old. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I'll take that. And, and, you know, I have to say it is kind of a compliment. Because we've had so many changes and we were production only for so long, a lot of people don't realize we've been doing this for mm -hmm. 12 years. 2006 it was such a fledgling industry and it's changed so much, I think, beyond what any of us, the original breweries, really conceived. You right. know, I mean, I remember sitting at Highland for an Asheville Brewers Alliance Christmas party and there were 13 or 14 of us and I don't think any of us really foresaw back then what was going to happen. I don't think anyone really could have. Um, maybe we should have knowing there was beer involved but now we know. Um, I, th I think the bad I should address right away is that there is a beer bubble it's gonna burst. As great as it is and as wonderfully received as the breweries are and everyone gets behind it, especially in a small town. If you open a new business here, you are guaranteed to get people coming in before you're open. We had people knocking on our doors wanting memberships and we're still painting. And I'm doing drywall and I'm on a 14 foot ladder and they're so excited, which is amazing. And I think the, the support local movement, it's, you're so much more aware of it in a small community and it's amazing to have the you know, support of the community rallying around you, you're gonna get that right away. The sustainability of it, it's really scary and it's daunting. I think um, summer, great. You know, the phrase, the more the merrier, it does help bring people to the area. You know, you're seeing it in Asheville. A lot of people were comparing it to the wine scene in Napa Valley. Hey, it, it, it works and it's tourism. Personally, I know what February looks like in the mountains and I'm it's really scary to me. You, you see these, the bad part of the growth industry is that people think it's a cash cow and that they've got the money, they've got the financing, and that they will just put all the money they can into a beautiful space. And um, beer becomes the kind of the back burner for them. It's not a priority. They're not starting with good beer. The second thought would be, or an afterthought would be hiring a brewer. And I, and I think that's going to really be a detriment in the long run. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's a great time to drink beer, don't get me wrong. <laughs> and it's pushing a lot of, all of us, to make the best beer we can because you have to be able to compete. I, I remember Hilton um, with Asheville Ale, Ale Trail way back when. I think it was the 12th brewery opening in Asheville. And we were talking about it. It was another husband and wife, and it was, that's great, you know, more, more families, more women in the brewing industry, and, and he said, yeah, I asked them what they were going to focus on, and they said, making great beer, and he said, that's not enough anymore, and that was like a light bulb moment for me, you know, it's really not enough anymore, you've got to be offering so much more, and be able to, I hate to say compete, but you have to compete with your neighbors, so I, I think, I think it's going to be really tough in the future, Yeah, I do. Yeah, well, to 
pick to pick up one thing you just mentioned. You you were talking about more women in yes. the beer industry, and that's definitely something else that has changed, but not necessarily changed a ton since you entered the field. I, there no, are a lot more women. I would say it has changed two hundred percent. Yeah. Since I got involved in two thousand six. I mean, my experience might be different than everyone else's. How many other women would you have seen usually at like an ash bowl? At a at a like a brewers meeting yeah one i mean really it, it was i can only think of cheryl yeah from heinzel mention and she and i were for a while the only ones um even at beer festivals very few women y even as as um, customers coming in and festival goers because i think traditionally women didn't think they liked beer people didn't think they were the beer audience and it's been so refreshing to have more women in the beer scene I don't necessarily feel like I was discriminated against because I was one of the few but it's just nice it was nice to see that growth to see more women becoming part of it to see more women appreciating craft beer and realizing it wasn't this guy drink you know breaking down those stereotypes yeah. I think, and just having that perspective of having more women in the in the field and that voice uh, it made it more and it continues to make it more well-rounded I think the more you can get the more perspective it's gonna help the industry it's gonna help open people's minds and maybe introduce some new things they hadn't considered yeah so. and it seems that Hendersonville in particular has an awful lot of women absolutely yeah which is nice and it, it's as of right now I think all the breweries that are open are all husband and wife or you know partners mm -hmm. which I don't know on the average that's probably really high it's pretty a hundred percent is a pretty high percentage yeah, yeah. For, I would say yeah. so right <laughs> yeah that's a good point <laughs> yeah no it, it is here all of the breweries that are currently open right? are and we even though we don't have probably any time and we don't get to see each other and hang out we joke about doing the kind of couples therapy too of getting together and having a beer to kind of decompress from running a business together and being in this industry and you know being partners in it so it's yeah it keeps it interesting yeah so if if another woman wandered through right now and was asking for your advice if she wanted to enter the craft brewing industry what kind of advice would you give her for for jumping in oh wow I'd say don't open in Hendersonville I feel like <laughs> It <laughs> might be a little saturated. I was wrong about Asheville 12 years ago, but um, you know, when Joe and Lisa at Sanctuary were going to open, we talked to them a long time. We all, you know, happy to give any advice we could because of all the struggles we had opening. I honestly don't know if it's as hard for women to get involved right now as it as it may have been 12 years ago. Uh, you know, Leah Wong, I think she was a a big change in the industry really taking over and, and being a big role player for Highland and for the local beer scene I think a lot of those barriers are broken down already and I and I don't know that women would necessarily struggle I, I might be wrong again I've always been in male dominated industries and I've tried not to let it be a distraction from my aim and I hope women don't feel that way now because I think if we're doing male female it's just going to take away from the energy of where it needs to go. Yeah. So if we just can support and, and all really not think about that. I don't know if that's possible, you know, but in an ideal world and maybe I'm disillusioned, I don't feel that it's really, um, that it's happening anymore, you know? And I don't feel like it happened 12 years ago. Yeah. Maybe I was blind to it. I don't know. But I, I feel like there's so much support and women, you know, they're, here I come no matter what what are you gonna do you know what are you gonna do about it and again more perspective more energy everything that we can bring is, is going to be helpful to everybody yeah I hope <laughs> definitely so um, you mentioned your flagship beers here yes. earlier do you have a favorite personal favorite of your flagships or anything of any of yours can you pick a favorite it's really hard I have to say owning a brewery you do not get to drink as much beer as you would think um, I drank a lot more beer before I owned a brewery, mostly because of the hours, the ABC laws. Um, it's hard, you know, you're pouring your beers all day and you're talking about them and you're getting feedback. I have been known to do a flight when I get a night off, just to refresh my memory. I would say my favorite, which we haven't made in a while, 
is um, part of our sour and our barrel aging program and it was our Belgian artisanal amber. We put it in red wine barrels with raspberries and champagne yeast and did a secondary fermentation and it was probably it's probably my favorite beer we've ever made. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I still think about it and our regulars that know about it ask when it's coming back and <laughs> maybe it's because of um, how infrequently we can make it. You know, I think it was aging two years in the barrel. So, um, yeah, I, I'd say that's my favorite. My go-to of our standard beers is probably the IPA. Yeah. Yeah. It's just nice and smooth. Do you have a go-to standard from another North Carolina brewery? I have to say, I read that question it's yesterday. It's the hardest question on the whole list. I think it is because, again, we don't. I don't get out of here. <laughs> and to be honest, owning a brewery, it's really hard to go out and have a beer <laughs> because it's work. I feel like I can appreciate it as much as everybody else can. I get a lot of um, my beer knowledge of the local industry from our regulars because they're going to openings and they know about bottle releases and they know about special beers. My go-to is so old school, it's Green Man's ESB. I think it's um, probably one of the first craft beers I had. I used to work right next door to Dirty Jack's. To me though, it was just always a perfect beer really drinkable and he had it always dialed in that's probably i don't really know a lot of the current beers other breweries are making <laughs> green man's still solid right yeah. yeah yeah john's still doing a great job yeah so uh when you're not here what are some of the things you enjoy doing i also found that one really hard to answer um <laughs> i always i always phrase it as i know you're here a lot yes when you're not here yes, when we're not here The reason we moved here was really to be out in nature more, to get away from the priorities of modern life and really try to get back to something more primal, I guess. So we try to get out and hike. We try to go out. We're trying to get out and kayak. Um, just get out into nature and get away from technology and kind of your everyday. I think it's really important to do that. Um, to be at home on my couch. <laughs> it's probably one of my favorite activities. Um, and lately we've been ha we have been trying to get out and support local businesses, um, even just come here on a night off and drink beer and see what it's like as an experience as a customer. Yeah, That's been really fun. And to actually enjoy some of the music that we book that we don't get to sit and really spectate at and appreciate. So yeah, um, yeah. try to live like a normal person, I guess, is the answer. <laughs> it's a good answer. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. Well, that's kind of the full list of the questions that I brought. Is there anything we didn't talk about that you would want to talk about? Let me see. Um, to get the full picture of Southern Appalachian. I would, I would say, just from a historical standpoint, with all the breweries opening, and you know, I kind of look at what new breweries are doing, and I think, wow, can you do that now? Well, we did it that way, but that was 12 years ago. Um, and I think back to your question about women getting in the industry or, or new breweries, a big thing that we took so much advantage of was the support of small business um, supporting agencies and, and places like SCORE and Mountain Biz Works, Self Help, Henderson County Partner for Economic Development, city officials. This was pre-crowdfunding for us, and I think it really benefited us. We had to write a solid business plan to get any sort of lend lending. Um, we also were expanding and moving when the economy was tanking, and SBA loans were there, but not a lot of people were um, expanding. So we wrote, rewrote the business plan three or four times, and it really helped us, I think, get a solid idea of how to make it work. It scares me a little that new breweries aren't taking advantage of these agencies that are here to help them succeed. And, and I love crowdfunding, but I think, um, I think having a viable business plan is really important. It's about the beer, but if you really wanna succeed, especially in today's climate, in such an oversaturated market, you gotta make sure it's solid, all yeah. aspects. Yeah. yeah. And I hope we're still doing that. Some days I feel like I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. That makes great sense. Well, 
Anything else you want to add? I don't think so. Is there anything maybe I skipped ahead on on your No, list I think you did a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. This has been really cool to be a part of. Thank you.